Okay, now don't let this scare you, but this video is for people who know just enough machine learning to get kind of started in NIME, but who just can't get the model to work. It has a lot of tricks in it, and I think if, if, if I were somebody who were learning this, then this video would have tons and tons of things to help you get started if you have no idea what's wrong with your model, but you do know how to basically drag the nodes. Um, you might just want to skip to the parts that uh, that you find useful because I'm going to go over lots and lots of stuff. However, uh, the basic gist of it is that when you can't get your model to work and you don't know why, you can test multiple models, and there's a lot of stats that you can use in the uh, in the interim in order to make sure that you're on the right track. Let me tell you what my problem was. Um, so I have a machine learning model that I just could not get working. And it was weird because, because the point of this model, first let me tell you what I'm trying to do. What I was trying to do is take these images and see if I can get a vision recognition system to give me an idea of what the dimensions are on this person's, like in this case, it was the mouth. So I, I took a bunch of, these are artificially generated people. And so I have dimensions for like the lip width and, and all kinds of things, right? So what I'm trying to do is get a machine learning model to look at this picture and collect stats on these 500 artificial people and somehow estimate these numbers. Now, I had actually done this just to determine gaze direction and I had a model that worked. Um, and so when I tried to copy that model, I it, it just, it didn't go. Now, Earlier in this same workflow, I had these guys, mannequin faces, right? And the mannequin faces had a, uh, another machine learning model, which I got, which was roughly shaped like this here. Again, don't let this scare you. I'll, 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 um, the neater version of this is actually just this over here, the original model. It had inputs, which were the pictures, and then it did some stuff, and then it went to the output, the learner. But I'm not going to connect that because um, you'll well, it's there's a lot more to it. The point is that this model was doing stuff, and so I said, okay, now that I've determined gaze direction, let me try to determine actual facial features because they're they're looking forward. Now, the problem is, no matter how hard I tried. I just, there were too many variables, like, like this convolution layer, for example, has all kinds of settings, and this one has more settings, and this one has more. And you just don't know which settings are going to actually train your model. Now, um, again, if you're, if you're new to machine learning, but you get the idea, uh, then there are lots of things you can do in order to figure out how to get your model to actually produce results. But, but, but before you do that, we need to kind of understand some things about uh, how you set these things up in Nine. So if I come back over here, uh, you note that this is the table that I'm working with. Let's go back to this one. This is the last, this is the last node that occurs before everything sails off into the world of the model, right? So from here, it actually, takes a model that has been pre-built, sent to a learner, and then it plugs the data from here into that model. And if I broke into these components here, I go to component and go to open, you'll see that it's the same structure. That image data, let's see what it looks like. Right here, here he is, okay? So here's my data table. These are the inputs and these are the outputs. So ultimately what I'm trying to do is take an input layer that understands pictures. And I'm trying to 
build an output layer that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers, right? And that's going to be for each picture. So to set those things up in Nime, you first have to send some of your data into the model that you built, all those brown nodes. And then you provide the tr what they call the training data into um, to the learner. And what that's going to do is, it, it for me, it's going to take 400 of my 500 people. And it's going to let the network learner learn all the patterns. Now, but this is only a box that has patterns of, you know, things that get multiplied on the data. After that box, see that 80% up there, uh, gets trained, then I take a testing set or a validation set or something like that. It actually should be the testing set, and I'm not, I'm not using it down here uh, for, for a couple of reasons. It really, it's, it's not meant to be used on this. It's meant to be used on other people's pictures. So I'm actually not using this as the testing set. So just to see if my model works, I'm just taking the same validation data. Um, so training data is the data that you use to build your patterns. Validation data is the data that you use after a particular pattern is built each round to see if you're on the right track. Testing data is where you take everything you've done after all of those rounds called epochs and sees, okay, if I multiply everything I learned on my final testing data, do I get results? Let's say, here's what I got. It looks like nothing. It's actually, it, and it may be nothing because of the way I end up testing these things, um, but they're actually very small numbers in here. So it's, it's not a complete fail. Uh, so the thing is that, is, is that Whenever you're trying to train a machine learning model in particular, you need to do at least the brown nodes, the green node, and the dark green node. Um, there, are, there are ways to kind of skip steps, but, but for the most part, that's the process. So again, note that we are taking in input, that is a picture, and we're spitting out outputs which of these values. The way this ne network node is configured is that the input, it says, okay, well, what, what am I sending in? Oh, look, from image. Okay, so image binary, that's the table with all the faces in it. Um, and it's got, these are 80 pixels by 80 pixels, and they have a red, a green, and a blue channel in them. So when you multiply all those out, every pixel gives you, uh, well, total, you have 19,200 pixels when you multiply this 6,400 times three. And that's going to be how many little, little neurons they call them, but uh, how many nodes are in the start of your network. So when I have that brown input node, this is how many it takes in, in the beginning. And now it's shaped like this little, little kind of, kind of a square times three here. The target data the output, remember I'm trying to guess for these guys, is a bunch of decimal numbers. And the way I determine whether or not I'm on the right track is by looking at a loss function. And you can choose different loss functions from here. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Know that the first node is going to have to have as many data points as you're feeding into it. The last node is going to have to have as many data points as you're getting out of it, in my case, seven. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff you do in between, and this is where the complication arises. So uh, rather than looking at that, let me, let me show you what I started with. I started with this. It's an input layer, and it takes in 19,200 layers. I mean, not layers, uh, neurons. And then, because I'm dealing with images, I'm actually using something called a convolutional neural network. Think of a convolution as being kind of a blur on pixels. So when I highlight this background here, right, you can see that I have three by three pixels. And every, every uh, say this is a three by three image, right? What a convolution does is it basically considers maybe these four 
as their own cluster, or these four, or these five by five. All right, so 25 is a cluster. The convolution tangles up pixels, and it allows you to intelligently blur not only next to each other if you lined everything up, but skipping by rows so that you can assess square images, right? Because really, when I take this 80 by 80, the, the simplest way to represent it in the computer is to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 80, 81, 82, 83, 160, 161, 162, and it goes in a line, right? And so if I took these pixels and unfolded them, they'd unfold in a straight line. The problem with that, of course, is that it's, it's a squarish image. And so I want, okay, I may want these 10 guys next to each other, but then I want to skip a whole 80 and then take those 10 guys next to each other. And that gets complicated if you're, you're trying to work with those things. So what you do is you take a kind of node that allows you to look not only like this, but also like this. But note, if I line these squares up, I'd have to go you know, by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, skip, and then do four, and then skip and do four. And so the convolution kind of takes care of that for you. So when we're adjusting that stuff, we do math, do math, and then I flatten it into a line for real because my final output is going to have to get flattened again and eventually give me just a flat seven answers at the end. Okay. So if I wanted to train this network, first of all, this is how I build it. And I should be able to well, this is going to fail because, because I'm actually expecting, yeah, it's going to fail because of the way I set it up. And, and I'll show you how I set it up shortly. But anyway, so if I wanted to train this network, what I would do is something like this. I'd build the layering system first, and then I'd feed in my table, right? which in this case is just same old same, right? I'd feed in the stuff I use to train, the stuff I use to validate, and then the stuff I use to test, which again, I'm not using here because it's another table elsewhere in the workflow that I'm, I'm doing. But so you'd feed it into there and say, okay, great. Uh, now I know all of my weights. Um, and now that you have this kind of grid of things to multiply by, it's like, okay, give me the data. Give me the new data. I'm going to try to predict some things. So that's where you feed in that last set of data. And then you can, you can come out with some, you know, hopefully a model that makes sense. Okay, so this is the setup. Um, my initial network was something like this. Now, again, I tell you that I, I knew I was working with pictures, and so I wanted to try to, try to use this. But I didn't know what the settings were. Um, in a previous video, you may have seen me use a, um, a model of models to vary parameters. And I, I learned a lot about how to do that more efficiently. And that's the whole point of this video. Okay, so here's, here's what happened. At the end, I actually came up with a really cool pair of punch lines. Now remember, I had no idea how to set this up and my model just was not learning. Eventually I got answers and I'll walk you through the answers, but here's what the answer was, at least for right now. At the end of the day, this tells you basically my accuracy against what we call the ground truth. So remember in here, right here, these guys actually had real numbers. Now, f when I run my model on my actual data, they don't. It's, they're just going to be missing. Like when like plugging into this bottom one here, I actually have pictures of real people from Wikipedia. And it, the model does perform. Um, but again, for, for demonstration purposes and also... Um, just for basic stats comparison, I'm feeding in old data, which you, you normally don't do. But let me go down here and kind of show you what I had. These are these guys' ground truths. 
I made predictions based on this, and then I just subtracted the difference. And when I subtracted the difference, I ended up with this much difference on average across all 100 of my people uh, that, that ended up in the, the, the prediction set. Here's what the average prediction was off by. Here's what its standard deviation was. Was it stable? What it was off by for the, for the mouth angles, what the standard deviation was for the mouth angles, and so on and so forth. All right, so these are kind of just like predictions. But, but the, the cool thing is that these are the settings that I didn't know I was supposed to set. Now, they're not all the same settings because I actually tried several uh, optimizers and an optimizer is just a way of zooming in on the kind of stats you want as you train your model, right? And, and we'll see it inside the learner. I didn't know which optimizer to use, let alone which learning rate or all these other settings. Um, again, we'll get to it. There's, a, there's, there's quite a bit here. But these are the earlier settings for giving me the right direction. You can see that I ended up using RMS prop as this particular model. RMS prop has these two settings. So a learning rate of close to 0 0.0015 and a row of 0.96 it is uh, an, an, an epsilon of 0.99. These are the settings that I should use. Oh, and batch sizes of 16. These are the settings that I should use for my network learner options. This is what is so so kind of kind of intimidating about the machine learning nodes. When you first you're excited, you just learn machine learning and you you went online and you did it in Python and you took a Google course and you did all that and you're like, "Okay, Jupyter notebooks, I'm ready to go into Nime or something because I I don't want to compile things or build things or whatever." And now I'm ready to make my own machine learning thing. And then you you run into a box like this. It's it's asking you for all these settings. <laughs> you're like, I don't I have no idea what to do here. Uh, so th the whole point of putting models on models is that it can kind of teach you what to do. You see these defaults, right? The defaults for RMS proper 0.001. And we saw in that table that 0 0.0015 was better. Row is 0.9, but 0.96 was a little bit better. And epsilon is this really, really low number. And it turned out that that 0.99 worked better as an epsilon. Don't ask me why. Um, but that was just in the group that I ran. Now, how do you how do you learn this? Okay, now let's get to. So, so this was one more time. These are my settings. Now I know because I ran through models of models. We'll build models of models shortly, but there's more. Which model? parameters actually contribute to uh, a better model. I ran a linear correlation on, whoops, just everything. <laughs> just, I'm looking at everything that, that is a parameter, right? So I took out the actual predictions because those, those aren't settings I control. And then the looping stuff, I took that out. But I looked at the, the distance the absolute distance, by the way, um, because that was a little tricky. I was like, why, well, why is it learning? I trained it. And what, you know, but you have to take the absolute distance. Um, and I just made a huge correlation table to see what, what it's related to. And what you get is this nice and pretty, right? Note that I right clicked and I went to view correlation matrix. I did not go to the normal output. It's just tables, right? It's not pretty. When you want pretty, you go to the view. I go to the view and I say, I want low distance between my prediction and my ground truth. So here I can see, oh, these are strongly, oh, it's correlated with itself, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look at this batch size, positively correlated. Apparently in my little my little loop of models of models, the higher the batch size, the higher the distance. 
We don't want high distance. We want low distance. We want our predictions and our ground truth to be close together. So we actually don't want the blue guys. We want the red. Here, take a look at this. Convolution 2A filters. Well, that's this first one right here. And apparently there's a setting in there called filters. Um, the more filters I have in my little group of uh, sample models, the lower the distance. They're negatively correlated. Hmm. Okay. Nice. How about this one? The higher the learning rate, the lower the distance. Well, it's not too high, right? It's within reason. Oh, it's the same thing for RMS prop and for Atom. Hmm. Okay, so that, that helped. And for SGD. But we also note that Atom Beta had it. Now, since my winning model was actually an RMS prop model, the one that I would care about is probably these guys. So these are the things that, that I now kind of know about my model. The hard part of all of this, and actually it ended up being the fun part, was getting here. Let's backtrack. How do we know? So, so you know that I'm not showing you the rest of the screen just yet, and, and you saw glimpses of it. Um, what, what is all this? What, what is that? <laughs> that is actually the way I test multiple models. And I'll walk you through the gist of what it is um, so you can do it yourself. It, it really is kind of fun. Like I said, don't let it scare you. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. Um, so before I got here with my winning model, I actually chose the winning model from all the models I trained. This is the table, which has, just for demonstration's sake, only 12 models. I actually trained, well, I tried to train 400. Um, 42 of them had errors, and that ended up giving me something like 200, 240 models that worked. Uh, because 42 rounds of four guys that I tested gave me 160 models that didn't go all the way through. But I had 240 models, and if you look at this, um, I've sorted them by distance from ground truth. And this was the winner. So this is the one that ends up getting tested over there, right? But this was just visually sorted in the nine table. I actually had to use a node to do that sorting. The top K selector told me, here's the thing that I want lowest at the top. So I did it ascending as a sort, and I only took the top six models on this. And I noted to sort the output because and move missing cells at the end of the list. Because when I didn't do this, it basically just said, here's your clump, and it didn't respect the lowest one. But when I do that, I end up with this nice table, which puts this guy at the top. And then I can just peel off the top guy. And you know, like I only take row number one right here. And I end up with he filtered the winning model only now like i told you i i learned a lot my, my machine learning level is still kind of at a c when it comes to you know how much i know about machine learning i'm not and because my machine learning was at a c and i thus had no clue what parameters what anything to do for settings on this stuff it it, it led to this kind of experiment one of the things that, that I learned while I was working on this was about this node. These nodes are flipping awesome because essentially all these brown guys can be smashed into these red guys and these red guys can be turned into tables. Nice. So what ended up happening is that if I look at this, you're like, how do you get a table to produce a model that can be trained? Well, among your winning models, and I didn't realize I had done this, I, I didn't just save stats, but I also, if you go to the specs, save something called a port object. Here it is. This is a model. In fact, this is the model. So if you come over here, sitting there quietly next to all the decimals is this guy. It's a NIME deep learning network 
with an output shape of seven. You're like, are you serious? That's a model? That's all your brown guys smashed together? Yes. So I come over here and I can, well, there's really nothing to say here. Is that there's the column that has the model in it. And then when you look at it, you've seen this in NIME, right? And you almost never use it. Uh, at least I don't use it. However, it does tell me that a specific model has been loaded. Like this 40 and this 18 isn't always like that. This flattened to 972, the tense layer is a 300. Not always like that. So this is cool because you see how the input layer has that image that we looked at. And it has our seven guys that we're predicting as the output. And it apparently chose one of my branches. Now, now I'll, I'll show you shortly that not all versions of my model even have a second convolutional layer, but this was one of the ones that did. So this was the better model. It had two convolutional layers and then it did some zooming in. Now, the thing though, is that when I did models of models, I was varying a bunch of parameters and I need to put those parameters into the model because note that what this thing does is it trains the guy who had settings like these. Um, and, and they don't necessarily come in the variable form. See that? Like this doesn't, this doesn't have all the variables that actually feed into my model of model trainings. So I had to pull those variables out using a table row to column variable. And, and all that's doing is it's taking the rest of these folks and turning them as you select them into variables. So now you see that it has put these guys in here, whereas they didn't start that way. If I come over here, there they are, right? RMS prob, they all got added. That's cool. Because this 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 guy didn't have them naturally. This is plain old this plain old deal had just come from a bunch of loops. So the loops didn't remember which one. It's like, man, I, the winning model was model number three out of the 200 models that you tried. I don't know what the parameters are now. So you had to take the stuff out of the winning row and tell it. That, okay, these were the parameters from the winning model three. And then you feed them in just like a regular flow variable. And, and the model itself that you pulled out says, oh, 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 I know those settings. And so you come into here. And similarly, the network had a couple of settings as well that were also part of the winning row. And they get pulled in. See that? All these guys? Now, this is a good time to look at variables. You end up, when you're training models of models, using the flow variables tab a lot. A lot. Not only do you use the flow variables tab to, to kind of set different things. Like here's a loss function. Look at that, right? Not only do you use them to set the value in here, you also use them to report the value out here. So these are do, two different things. This is actually the input, and this is the output. And I use them at two different times. Okay, now let's get to the ugly part. Like I said, don't, don't let it scare you. It is ugly, however. I started off feeding in my data the way I described to you, and I didn't know the settings. But here's what happened. I sat there feeding in, once upon a time, this ugly guy, this, this cluster of all this stuff down here, looked like this one down here. And I took my data and I, I built the model and I fed it into the input layer and then I built the thing and I tried one layer and then it went to a flattened layer and then a dense layer. I also tried two convolutional layers and it went to a flattened layer and a dense layer. See? And then it went to a flattened layer and a dense layer and then it went to the final output. That's what it used to look like. But I didn't know whether I should use two convolutional layers or one. So here's what I did. Here's, here's the first part of it to test different structures of models. 
I turned this branch into its own cell. So I basically said, oh, okay, let me just train the, the one layer version from here to here. And then I wrapped this guy in a cell and he looked like this. There he is. Okay. And apparently I'm not able to, oh, there we go. But I also tried the two version and wrapped him in a cell. And he looked like this. Well, that's interesting. It's a different, different final shape. Yes, it is because both of my layers end up shrinking the work. Now, this is a good time to go into these, these nodes. Okay, it starts here. Here's the shape of my image. That's it. There's nothing else to do. Uh, float 32. Okay, that, that seems to work. Enough of that. It gets fed into one of these. Here's the actual convolutional layer settings. The filters are essentially like the number of different, I don't know, canvases. We'll just call them canvases for you to try out your various math experiments while you're machine learning. It's like, okay, I'm going to set this one random and I'm going to put some random matrices in here and I'm going to try it out. Um, so I'm using three filters. I tried using six. I ran into memory problems. So three is what it is. The kernel size is the size of the, the pixel blur, right? So you've got your pixel blur. You go three by three and, uh, or you could go five by five. I have found that five by five was really nice. Um, and I might try that in the future and use it as an option. In fact, I think I do try it and you'll see where, but the kernel size is essentially how much it blurs. Now, if you set this to one comma one, you're looking at one pixel at a time and all the convolutional layer does is nothing. It doesn't convolve. So it's just like, oh, this pixel is blue. Well, this pixel's blue value is this blue. This pixel's green value is this green. All right, next. When you set it to three by three, it says, here's the pixel and here are all its neighbors. I'm going to do math on it. And I'm going to use that math in some, some later layers. Strides is how far over your window scoots when you're doing all this. So if, if uh, let's go back to one of these tables so you can kind of get the grid view of it. A three by, th a, a three, by three convolutional layer, let's say that this is a picture, right? Three by three looks at pixels three at a time. And it says, here's my guy, and I'm gonna do some math to mix it with its neighbors three by three. Two by two, it makes it this way. And why do you wanna mix? Well, because you're, you're basically blurring and you're getting stats not by the pixel, but by the region, and it ends up working really nicely. Strides are how far over it scoots. So if you do a stride of one, it's gonna go here, it's gonna check that, it's gonna go here and check that, it's gonna go here and check that. But if you did strides of two, it's gonna go here and check that, then here, then here. If you did strides of four, it would check this, and then it would move over four. One, two, three, four then it would check this, okay? So that's what strides are doing. But essentially, once it's done convolving, you get one value. So, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't get this until I was seeing my layers shrink. So strides of one will give you, eh, okay, that's a value. Mm, then that's a mixed value. Mm, then that's a mixed value. Okay, and if I kept doing that, then it would have all these guys at the center. Again, let's say this is my, my guy, and uh, I want to check his neighbors. I could check his neighbors by including these edges out here that aren't necessarily visible, or I could not check him at all because he's on the edge. Either way, um, I'm going to start generating pixels from results. And so by the time I get down here in this convolution, he's going to be the re new result of all his neighbors. If you don't include edges, then this guy won't get evaluated, basically, and it's going to shrink. So he's, he's, not, he's, not, uh, he's not valid. So you'd consider him, you'd only consider this guy because he's valid. He doesn't, he doesn't touch the edges and he has all the neighbors. And so with valid, you lose this pixel. Because, again, he doesn't have all his neighbors, and so we can't, we can't look at it. Um, and so that is this setting. 
padding, valid or sane, right? As you're striding over, if you're clipping out neighbors, then you're looking at valid and you can expect this guy to shrink. And it is for that reason, not only the, sh the, the clipping and shrinking, but the fact that I have two strides, that this 80 by 80 becomes, let's go, uh, well, let's start with him because it's the same thing, but, but it has a subsequent note. This 80 by 80 becomes 40 by 40. Uh, apparently, I used some kind of setting um, to, to actually keep these guys uh, at 40 by 40 instead of 38 by 38. But know that one of these allows neighbors and the other one doesn't. Um, does it matter? Well, do you have information on the edge or would you just like to get faster? So these are the convolutional settings. And um, by the way, if some of the math doesn't seem to be contributing or, or um, kind of kind of uh, uh, passing along informative data, you can chop some of that out with your activation function. You, you have to look that up separately. I don't want to get into it in here. But these guys, I go in and I set their parameters. So I've got a variable called convb filters. And I also have some other variables. You saw us, uh, no, it's just, it's just filters. Filters is the only one. So I'm varying this number. But I could vary kernel size as well. Oh yeah, there it is. Tuple, DL Keras tuple. That's actually this, that's the kernel size. So if you go in here, there it is. And I vary this one. There it is. I change these and I have different values for them. Let's see what the value is. Look, currently the value is three. How about this one? Ah, five by five. Interesting. Okay. Strides. Two by two. Hmm. Okay. So I do this for all my nodes, right? I come in and let's look at the flatten layer. What parameters does it have? Okay, it's just flattening. It's just putting it in a line, so it doesn't it doesn't care. Why does it have 18 by 18? What happened? Well, that's got to be the result of this one, 2B, because this one ended at like 40 by 40. Now, this gets to this whole business in here. Because I didn't know the structure I wanted, I set up two structures, and I turned them into cells. Here's a cell for the one layer, Here's a cell for the second layer. I piled them onto each other as cells. And then I picked one. Which one? Random. Pick just one, random. So I, I chose an absolute only pick one. I don't know which. And it chose the second one. It says, okay, randomly, I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Then it turns it back into a model, which is pretty dope. If you look at it, all right. It's as if none of this ever occurred and we had gone straight from here to here to here to there. See what I'm saying? I had multiple options, squished them, and now I can use other nine stuff in order to pick which one of my structures to, to, to apply later. Nice. I flatten it. Then I have a dense layer. So the, the, Number of nodes that's coming in, giving my given my 18 by 18 by 3, is ultimately going to be 972. The neurons, it's going to be 972 neurons when you squish this into a line. And I put a name on this one just because, I don't know, felt like doing it. You didn't need to, but um, there's, there's no need for this. But it, it'll help me remember what layer things are happening on. Ah, 300 dense use it, units. Is it always 300? Apparently not. Again, flow variables. Ah, set dense units, parametrically. Okay, cool. Next. Yeah, okay, nothing going on here. I don't understand this stuff. I choose. I chose regularization because I read somewhere that it was it was the hip thing, uh, but I, I don't really. I don't know how to explain what that is. So, 
I'm going to go ahead and get out. And then lastly, remember this, this guy, once he was 18 by 18 by three and he was square, I flattened him into a line of 972, apparently. Flatten him into a line of 300. And how many answers were we looking for? Seven. I flattened him into seven. Why does it say two? Well, this is a parameter. So, go to flow variables, the number of columns that was from earlier, it's set earlier in the workflow. Seven. Seven answers. Okay. So, no, it's not two. It's, it's a flow variable set in here for m units. I named him sig last so I could identify him easily. And there you go. We were able to have two different structures and we were able to not so much programmatically pick one, but we were able to use familiar nine stuff instead of a bunch of red squares we couldn't touch in order to, to do that. And so if you want to train multiple options for your, your machine learning, you don't know whether you should have this many layers or you should have 10 of them or whatever, then you can actually just do all versions. Here's a conv, here's, a, here's two cons, here's some other layers like max pooling in, in there, and then I could just smash them. And then I can put them in a loop and say, choose row number three. And it's actually going to, to do your custom model. Awesome. Okay, so now our model is built. We're going to feed it to to the learner using this kind of setup. It used to look like that. Now, the reason I have four of these is because note that I had all these parameters, right? And yet, I didn't know, if you come in here, I, I, I didn't know whether I should use RMS prop or stochastic gradient descent or Atom. I mean, this is where all the problem lies, right? And when you're training your model, you're like, well, which of these, which of these methods for zooming in on accurate answers should I use? And when I use a method like Atom, for example, what do I do? Like, I, which, how do I set these? So not only do I not know what these are, but I don't know what these are. So I could just, you know, the, the parameters keep changing and, and all this other stuff. And unfortunately, what I found was that if you tried to, let's go back in here. If you tried to feed RMS prop values into, okay, we're going to have to hunt for this now. Let's go to options, uh, input, target, options. Ah, uh, where's the variable? Okay, I guess this is input. I guess this is target. I guess this is options. Okay, so let's go to options. Uh, wait, 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 what were we looking at again? Optimizer settings. Okay, let's go to flow variables. Here, optimizer. Uh, all right. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm, whoa, wow. It's buried. Dang. Okay, so anyways, but what I found is that if you tried to set like the optimizer in here, um, you could, and it would say, okay, I'm going to choose SGD. And then you try to set the SGV, SGD variables like SGD LR, but then you wanted to change it. Like uh, maybe if this guy said RMS in the same thing, but SGD was also set, NIME doesn't like it. In other words, NIME doesn't like you setting parameters for models you didn't pick. And so I had to actually take out my optimizer identifier I just I had to remove it. it so it doesn't show up on this list because it, it gets in the way, frankly. Um, I had to take out the optimizer identifier and say, okay, this is my RMS prop trainer. This is my Atom trainer. This is my SGD trainer. And so the reason there are four of these is because they all have hard-coded optimizers so they can accept specific parameters. If I right-click and I go into my component and I open it, then I can come in here and you see this says stochastic gradient descent. It is not controlled by a parameter. And that way I go to flow variables and I only set the SGD LR value. 
But if I say wanted to go to Adam, open this one. Oh no, don't do that. Don't expand. You can mess up my stuff. Okay, open here. If I go to Adam and go to options, okay, I've set him specifically to Adam and his flow variables only take the Adam flow variables. Nime stops complaining and we win. And we're so happy about that that we're going to go in and change the color of this guy. I'm going to edit him. Uh, I say he's a learner. I'm going to say he's a visualizer. Why? I don't know. I'm just showing off that you can do it. There we go. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> that was a poor, pretty cool trick. I saw somebody else doing that. You could put uh, you could put uh, icons on them, right? So I come in here, component, open them up, edit, drag a PNG, and sure enough, you can get you can get nodes that look like they got pictures on them and colors. So, anyways, it's just uh, funsies. That's there you go. So I've trained different optimize. I actually don't like this because that is not what this thing does. <laughs> so let's change it back. It's a learner. All right. Now, once I'm done with this, I execute the node. Um, by the way, let's let's take a look at the learner's settings so you can kind of get this. The image is what comes in. There it is. OK, that doesn't need a parameter. The target data is what goes out. Again, pretty stable. Mean squared error as my loss function as I'm learning per round? I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's legit. You have you have quite a few things. So again, I go in to the target, and there's my loss function. Hey, look, loss function. Look at this. It says Org.nime.dl.caras.core.training.dl.caras.loss.function.dl.caras mean absolute percent zero. Wow, that's that's a mouthful. Um, but I, I changed the loss function. And again, that's just another way of controlling it. The thing is, how do you know to set... See, this is a string. How in the world would you have known that you should set your string to this? Okay, so let me interrupt, and before I get to this, let me interrupt and show you how you know. Um, by the way, you you execute the network, and it's it's you know it's got some stuff, but here's the input comes from image, and then you have to add outputs because maybe you want to. I click this. Maybe you you want to not only show. Uh, remember my names, dents. They're in the front. But maybe you don't just want to show SIG last, which was my final layer with seven in it. Maybe you also want to show the, the state of some of these other layers in the model. It, these things don't automatically start there. You have to you have to add the output. So I had to add SIG last here. And I was like, hey, report him because uh, I'm going to use him for predictions. But I could also report the state of other nodes, which I plan to do later on for other reasons like looking at pixel values as they change and stuff. So if you ever wanted to follow the, if you've ever been to Google Playground and you know how they they uh, show you what's going on on each layer, okay, you can, you can help yourself do stuff like that by adding more outputs and looking at each layer here. Okay, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with it here. Um, nothing, nothing really spectacular going on in this workflow. There's nothing controlled by variables. So there you go. One of the fun things, uh, I told you this was fun because I, it was a lot more fun than just trying out brown nodes randomly. <laughs> Let me tell you, you're like, how's this fun? Trying out brown nodes randomly over seven nodes with boxes that are all blank is less fun. That's what I'm saying. So um, here's what you do in order to learn what is there. When I configure this, I just configured it however. I just set it up using random guesses. And what I did was I come in here and I'd select Adam and then I'd be done with it. But I'd also 
choose a variable here. I would just type one. And when you type things like, when you type names in these boxes, epochs, optimizer, when you type names in these boxes, like optimizer identifier, they get spit out as variables. That's awesome. So if I right click and I look at the, the resulting network, just any normal table. Oh, look, it's describing my network. But it also tells me the names of these, these boxes that I filled in. Oh, there he is, optimizer. ID. So that's what nine things is legit for choosing Adam. Hmm. Okay, cool. This is what nine things is legit as a string for choosing MAPE, the mean absolute percentage error. Okay, okay, nice. Now I'm going to go back in and configure my variables to choose SGD, and I get all my options. What I did then is uh, I kept changing the parameters, and I just put together a temporary table in Excel. So let's go to Excel. Here's what I I was spitting out these guys, and I've I've deleted the ones that that were irrelevant, but yeah, I was just saying, oh, okay, here's, here's, here's one round of things I got from nine. Nine thought this was legit for RMS Pro. Here's the next round of things I got from, from nine. Nine thought this was legit for SGD. So I just exported those variables. And then I came to this screen and literally copy pasted it. I just, I, I, I copied these, I copied these. I just pasted them, pasted them into Excel. And, and actually, most of these guys were pretty, they were all the same. I wasn't varying everything. I was really only varying these. But when I didn't know what nine would accept as a parameter, then, I mean, this is the way you did it. Then what I did is I said, oh, and by the way, this is a good opportunity to change the kernel size. So I, rather than opening up all those nodes again, I just saw that it was three, 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 and then changed them two, two, four, four, five, five. So I just, I just typed different things that I wanted to see. All of my conv Bs were threes, but I said, maybe I want to test four. Maybe I want to test five. Maybe I want to test six. All of my Adam LRs, because I was not going to open seven nodes, were 0 0.001. And I said, maybe I want to test this or this or this. So in Excel, I basically laid out all of the values I wanted to test. Now, if you remember my other video, I basically used the cross joiner to come up with every single combination. Now, the cross joiner would be ridiculous here because I got two options. And if I split this off as a column or something, I'd have two options times three options times three options. Oh my God. No. Uh, if I did two options times three options times three options, already I'm up to 18 different models. Oh, oh man, I'd, I'd end up with something like two or three or four to the 23rd as far as the number of models I'm testing. That's insanity. So there's no way I'm going to cross join all these combinations. I don't care that much to, to exhaustively do that. Here's the kind of backwards way you have to do it. Given this table in Excel, remember I exported all those variables with the boxes on the right, not the dropdowns on the left. The dropdowns on the left didn't exist at this point um, because I didn't have any variables fill, filled in. So if I went back to to uh, face to face, this guy. Um, when I initially ran this, they weren't accepting any parameters. I had to put output boxes on the right of everything that I might want to change, um, not just not just in the learners, but also in the layers. So I had to go back into the convolutional layer, go into flow variables, and type this here. This was in the very beginning. This did not exist, none of these. Um, but I had to make these exist. That way, I could get them out of there. They, you know, now you have tons of them because I'm putting them in. I, I, I put the results back in. 
Where did all these guys come from? Well, they didn't start there. They actually started in this Excel copy paste. So I, I took this and uh, made a table creator. I just went out here, created a table like this. Let's come to Excel, let's copy that, made a table and dumped them in there. You're like, this can't possibly work <laughs> because they don't, they don't have any structure. They don't, they don't have the same number of things. I'm like, aha, but what if we dump them in there? It doesn't say, okay. What if we dump them in there and here's what we get, a mess, but we used a row ID to turn these into rows and put these guys as the row names. And then we used a transpose to swap them and made them columns. And then we did some processing to get everything straight. And that's exactly what I did. That table that I made became this table. And it is in fact that table. It's, it's you know, it's exactly what I showed you. Um, but I send it through some things. I first of all move everything over. Then I transpose it. And you note that I have some, some missing values here, right? Now remember, we're not cross-joining, but we do want to try models of models. So, uh, but this is cool. This is already legit. Um, but everything's a string, and, and these are clearly numbers, some of them. So I did a column auto typecast. And typecast everything. And what I got were, oh look, integers. These knows these are integers. It knows these are doubles, decimals. These stayed as strings. Very cool. Very, very cool. And then, in order to, I'm so proud of this. I'm so proud of this. Watch this. Models of models. This is a, is a, is a gangster moment in coding. <laughs> okay, so what I did was loop through the columns column list loop okay i want to i want to take every column separately so every every column that's going to be separately treated goes over here every column that's going to be on every round goes over here there's no such thing in this case so i'm i'm i, I spare no columns every single one of these guys is going to be looked at individually the last column that gets looked at is sgd momentum apparently and let's see what comes out. Okay, that column by itself. It I I typed in to my Excel when I was when I was busy saying, oh, uh, let me try this guy. Then uh, I left two options for myself. And so I'm going I'm gonna be able to pick between these two options. So first thing is first, I chop out the missings because I don't want to pick between missings. And let me come over here. And, oh, you know what? I should have chopped out the missings. No wonder I had to do, do it that way. Oh, well, well, it doesn't matter. So, oh, yeah, no, no, I did it. I did chop out missings. Go to a row filter and exclude rows if they're missing SGT momentum. It's not always SGT momentum. So I had to go into flow variables and say, whatever column you're currently on. Oh, looks like SGT momentum. Use that one. Whatever column you're currently on, use that one here and chop out its missings. And that gives you this. Now we're going to sample. We're going to use something called bootstrap sampling. We're just going to sample over and over and over and over and over from whatever is available. How many times? A hundred. I'm going to have every single one of these columns have a hundred samples from everything I typed. And all this other stuff, I did check use random seed because I want to sample randomly. And if I didn't check this, it does this nice little boring linear thing. Um, but I sample, and here's what I get. Boring and linear. Look, zero, 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 point, 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 point. Okay, nice. That's not going to be cute. So I use a shuffle node to shuffle what's there. Aha, cool. And then... There's something else I have to do. I tried to stack these. 
and it was giving me some craziness, which depended on how many options were in there at the time. So if I had two options, it's, it's giving me stuff like column two underscore 23 and it, it tries to join them in the loop and it makes a mess. So I need to turn these guys off. I don't, I don't like these. So I generate some fresh row IDs. Just replace them with nothing. Just nobody cares. And it gives me sanity. Row zero, row one, row two. These guys can all be stacked next to each other using a column of pin loop end. They don't have this. Well, maybe they do now, but they didn't in the beginning. And it's lining all these guys that were individually processed next to each other. And bam, look at this. Because I was training models of models, I always wanted the number of rounds or epochs in my learner to stay the same. So that's always going to be 25. But you note that, that it was picking randomly from all of the choices that I had. And to, to spare myself the headache of choosing only atom parameters when I used atom, I just had all parameters populate all the time, right? So RMS prob and all these guys, they're there. It's got all permutations of my stuff. And then I now have a hundred different models with randomly generated stuff um, to, to apply. Wait, there's more. It gets better. So although I don't really want to mess with my batch sizes or my integers, like I like 16, 32, and 8. I don't, I don't want to change those. But I would love to get a little bit more creative with my doubles. So if, if you can see, this can be 0 or it could be 0 0.001 or 0 0.1. It could actually be anything between 0 and 0 0.1. Because you've got mins and maxes here. Wouldn't it be nice to not be constrained by your own lame imagination in stuff like this? I only had four guys. So I come over here and do a math formula on all of my decimals. And I basically let each column be anything between the minimum and the maximum. And the way you do that is you take the minimum value, let's say it's zero or 0.1 or something, and then you add anywhere between the minimum and the maximum extra, right? So, so if your minimum were one, and your maximum worth 10, then you start at a minimum of one and you add anywhere from zero to nine to it. So the call max minus the call min, random, which is always gonna give you between zero and one as a, as a random thing. And sure enough, when you do that, you end up with a beautiful, more randomized set of parameters, right? I thought I was so cool when I figured that out as a, as a strategy. Anyways, I still think I'm pretty cool. So <laughs> at least for this workflow, maybe I'm not cool in a lot of other places. But uh, so, so once this is done, then I uh, send it to the chunk loop. Now, because I was recording this video and I didn't want to wait forever and I actually had to change some things, I only chose 12. Don't You don't need this though. I just went in and said, okay, well, let me, I said 12, uh, let me choose four of my hundred bottles, but I actually ran this last night and it did get all the way through. Uh, but, but, but for us this morning, I only chose four of my models. There you go. And yeah, so these guys all are, whoops, they're all going to get tested in this mess. All right. We've basically covered this ugly thing. We basically understand what what it is. The chunk loop just says take one row at a time. If I configure it, it's just rows per chunk is one. And that means it's going to take one row at a time. Whoops. And it, well, here, here it is. One model at a time and all of its stuff. And I want to, just like I showed you earlier, turn all these guys into variables. So I use a table row to variable loop to turn that whole thing into a bunch of variables. And then, only then, did I go into these and choose the dropdowns, right? You could have easily changed them into underscore inputs to tell yourself the difference between what gets exported and what gets input. These were the ones you used in order to determine what nine thought was legit. 
these are the ones you use once you know what's legit and you you produced your options and you want to you want to feed something else in so this one and this one do not have to be the same but i was lazy and i wanted to keep track of stuff without having underscores on everything and so i use the same value um yeah once the model param factory was built that's when i chose the drop down I had some other variables that initially came from the data and I didn't want to lose them. So I had to combine them with the model factory ones. And so I used a merge variables node in order to do that. And there you go. So instead of going straight from here to the input layer, it went from here to a merge with this model factory stuff. And the rest is almost history. Uh, it's not quite history though. So you know that somewhere in here, invariably, it's going to fail. Why is it going to fail? Because when you look into this output data, take the convolutional network, for example. Here's conv2d. I've got kernel size of this. I've got strides of that. And for whatever reason, I don't know, some combination of something is, is not going to work. I mean, I've got a lot of parameters here. I may, I may have done something funny with something, strides or kernel sizes or numbers that don't work. And I need to be able to stop errors or it, but, but keep testing models. Like if the model errors out, I don't want it to end my loop because I actually set this up before I went to sleep and I did not want it failing on the fifth round out of a hundred. And then I, I, I have lost work. So I set up a try and just bunch the whole thing inside of a try catch. And if it errors out, then it will produce just a string called error. It, it just has everybody, but, but the optimizer has error in it. And so if anything fails in here, it'll just say, okay, well, I, I couldn't return my final result. Let me just return the error next. And it moves on with life. So I wrap the whole thing in a try catch. That way I don't, that way I can go, you know, mow my lawn or do other things. Actually, I have to mow my lawn today. So I, I don't want to sit here babysitting this guy. This um, last thing that I want to show you uh, as part of this is uh, some extra stuff. In order to determine whether my model was actually working, right? Because if you recall, when we go in here, whoops, we go into open this component. We, we actually do train it and we actually do make predictions. Right, here are our predictions. I, because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, I haven't gotten a lot of practice with some of the, the explainable AI nodes, the XAI and the Shapley values and all that. I've heard of them. I don't know what they do. Um, I have to do this the caveman way. So taking individual predictions and comparing them to ground truth, if you remember, I do one more round of comparisons. Basically, this came with the original workflow. Create a collection column. These are my seven guys. And then I join them to these guys' original ground truth, which was a collection from earlier in the workflow. You didn't see it, but um, earlier, before, before the image converter, there's some other stuff that's that's happening with split collections and, and things um, back out here. So anyway, it compares those. Let's go in here. And it joins them on the row ID, okay? Because it's still the name of my mannequins, mass one, mass two, mass produced, that is. Okay, cool. I have the ground truth and the predicted and some stuff. I put them together. I also want to save the model, by the way. And I also want to output all my variables. I just I want to know what they are. That's, that's how I produce the big table at the end for comparing all the parameters, right? So once each individual model runs, this is my way of saving its specific parameters. Otherwise, of course, the loop won't know. I put them together in this nice fancy table 
which has looked at the distance between the overall seven values and the prediction, but also each individual of the seven values. And so this is how much they're off. That is done. Oh, and they're combined with all my variables. But that is done using some other nastiness. Just note some of the nodes in here. ND distance is like, hey, two vectors. How, how, how far are they total? This is the one that gives you, gives you just kind of, you know, an overall, an overall distance between this and this. This minus this is that. Okay, so that's that's a good guy. And then I do some group group by. Oh, and by the way, that's per per mannequin. Every row, it's like, what's the difference between this guy's predicted in ground truth? How about this lady? How about this lady? How about this one? And then I just average them. And I also take the standard deviation using a group by node. So I'm not grouping on anything. But what I am doing is taking the mean and the standard deviation of these guys. And I have to report, since I have two different kinds on the same variable, I have to use something other than the original. Okay. Cool. Those are some stats. This was unfortunate. It was unfortunate that I had to do it. Um, but essentially, when I was taking this first one minus this first one, this second one minus this second one, this third one minus this third one, there's some column stuff that I had to do for every individual, for every vector. The thing that hung me up this morning was that when you take those distances, take the absolute value. Don't just do predicted minus ground truth because what ends up happening is that some of them are higher and some of them are lower. And if you don't take absolute value, they're going to center around zero and you're going to think you have a great model when you don't. So this is just a basic distance measure. But take the absolute value if you're going to do that, or the square, or whatever. And I called it point distance. I put it in a table, and I transposed some stuff. Um, this is all uh, this is all just stuff you do in 9. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the specifics of it, because we're definitely past time. But, but I like this extract header node, because when you have a table that... that the, you know, your tables don't match up. Look at this. Okay, so this is nice, but if I try to pivot this and add it to mass 490, it the, it's not going to produce a neat table. So I'm going to have to change these row IDs so that all my stuff can go together with the same name. Problem is that my columns have lots of values. And when I look at those values, you see that it isn't just the seven values I like with their names. It's a bunch of other, other junk. And so what you have to do is when I transpose it, I have to only take these top seven. And that required me to do some sorting. And then when I do it, I have to put them on there. But what I like about the extract column headers is that it saves the column headers the way they were. It's not what I want. But it also makes a fresh table without that stuff. Now it's called column zero. Thank God. And so now I can do column appender and all that good stuff. But when I append, oops, I have column zero, and that's always the name, regardless of and, and I just do a row ID in order to make these guys into these rows. And so there you have it. Moved it over. The setting for that is this. I just take column zero, which is always the same name, remove it, but replace the rows with it. And from here on out, these guys will always be correctly named. Where did those come from? Before the transpose, they were the row IDs. And they weren't the row IDs until I pulled off the wrong row IDs. I do this for every individual. And it gives me every individual's version of the differences between their prediction and their ground truth, separated out by collection and everything. And then I do a group by on it to take the mean and the standard deviation. But note, I do it by type. I do it by type, 
double. If it's a double, take it. And the reason I don't do it manually is because later I'm going to do nose and ears and whatever, and it's going to give me, it's going to be a pain for me to do these individually. So if you're a double, I'm taking your mean and your standard deviation. And those are our stats. It gets sent out of the node. All these guys get sent out of the node. They get collected here. Bam. They're all built. And uh, these, are, these are the general steps for assessing your models of models, semi-randomized. Well, actually, randomized enough. Um, and then you can just look at the lowest absolute. Remember? Absolute. The lowest absolute distance. This is the best model. This model was horrible. I, I didn't run them for a lot of epochs, only 25. And then spit them back out on 50 epochs and found that instead of a bunch of zeros, oh, I'm actually getting values, which are kind of, kind of close-ish, maybe. <laughs> a bunch of zeros that, that's disheartening right so this was the best model and it's great because I actually know which model let me in fact go over here and save my top six models that I chose yeah cool save it right now tried to save the models as an excel table and it didn't like it and the reason why I didn't like it it said, please take this model out. It also made the thing huge. I don't know how they do it, but when I had 240 models, it was a 5.8 gig gig file. No. Okay. So these are, these are a bunch of brown nodes in there if you don't take them out. So I didn't take them out because I actually want to be able to pull a NIME table and uh, have the port object in there. And NIME, since it's the native format, can keep it. So now I can actually go to my hard drive and reload from a saved file the winning model and uh, have him do a model to or sell to model thing. And in a different workflow, I can actually run my stuff. So this is the end of the video. Um, let me just kind of recap a little bit. I knew enough machine learning to set this up, but, but there was no way I had a system of parameters or even knowledge of which layers should go in there to, to get something optimum. So what I had to do was essentially find a way to produce different versions of this, spit out what NIME knew I could control as parameters, feed different versions of those parameters thanks to my own kind of mixture, back into the table, and then uh, basically collect all the fancy stats on each model run with the understanding that your optimizers and certain other parameters can't be mixed up in the same run. So I actually had to do multiple things. This is nasty looking. I could easily just kind of wrap it up and put it in a, in a node, but I won't. And also I could wrap each individual one in a try catch block that way an individual model can fail and it can still test the others but lots of things that you can do initially i started down this track because i was considering doing machine learning on my machine learning getting a machine learning algorithm to tell me which set of these guys would be the best but um there's an obvious problem with that your machine learning has to have data and so if you're only testing onesies and twosies in terms of model, you're like, okay, I'm going to rearrange these things and I'm going to change this parameter. You haven't even built the table that you're supposed to machine learn on. If you wanted to do machine learning on your models, which I'm probably going to have to do for my astral stuff, because with my, my astrology research, I know the patterns are in there, but I have no idea how to set up that model. And so I'm going to do something almost exactly like this. It won't be convolutional because it's not a picture. Actually, it is a picture. But I'll show you that later. But um, uh, yeah, you have to produce this first before you can machine learn on it, right? So you have to actually run models of models. I, 
I didn't bother because machine learn what, right? Unless you're trying to have it design its own version, um, it's actually easier to just do a correlation, right? I'm not actually trying to have nine write a working model just yet given a random select. But this would be one of the early steps in doing that. Uh, but but if you just want to know what controls my best models, then you can come in here and just do a linear correlation on all your parameters. And it'll tell you right there. So this one, the number of filters in the first level is significant. Um, wow, not so much the number on the second level. And uh, the learning rates are valuable. All this other stuff is just FYI. Okay. Oh, yeah, by the way, one other thing on memory. I invite you to try this in 9. It'll make you feel good if you can get it to work. I kept running into memory problems. This is a separate matter, but I want to cover it here because it's not going to be a different recording. I set up an H2 database, and these guys used to live in my 9 workflow. All those thousands of pictures that I'm mining on, and they take up stupid amounts of memory in your workflow and stuff just drags. It's real bad. So I basically read those files, wrote them inside a database, and then reset this. Because if you don't reset your nodes, Nine is going to save. Everything that's green is a saved file. And so if you've got a table with 14,000 pictures like I did, 14,000 mannequin faces, um, then, I mean, you end up with a 27 gig workflow, which is what I ended up with. Ridiculous. Stuff doesn't run. So uh, what you do instead is you read them and then you put them in a database. Now, here's here's not really the place to, to, to tell you how to do that, but I can tell you where to go. If you want to set up an easy database, then here's here's where I have everything written. And you oh, let's suppose you don't know this. First of all, go online and download. Go to h2database.com. And now your computer is going to know how to read that, how to connect to it. Given that it knows how to connect it, and given that you've downloaded the appropriate nodes in 9, you can actually choose these kinds of settings. Look, org.h2.driver doesn't exist until you go to h2database.com necessarily. So you get it. You can tell it where to write. And um, once you've told it where to write, you can take a DB uh, uh, where is it? DB writer node and make a test table I'm not going to do that here because I have to open database connections and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, well, actually, I am going to do it. I'm going to reset this because this is how it works. And there it is. I execute this. Oh, database connections open now. And oh, it wants me to read. OK, never mind. I'm not going to mess with that. I'm going to close this connection. It's, it's, it's going to disturb my stuff. But you'll go in there and you can figure out what to do. And I just made a test table. And from then on, you can actually find that file on your hard drive. If you didn't know um, these dialects and things like that, go to where H2 is installed. And uh, whoops. Go to where H2 is installed. And there are two things you want to do. After you install H2, they have this, this console here. And it tells you kind of how your first database is called. You can test connections and stuff. And then when you go to, to this file, h2.server.properties, you can look at all the different fancy ways of connecting. So, yeah, that's just kind of a, kind of a bonus for when your files get too big and you don't want to have a bunch of stuff sitting in NIME anymore. I reset all these nodes so that I don't have them green. Um, when they're green and they're big, then your workflow becomes unruly. But uh, yeah, all right. Hopefully this video helped you uh, 
diagnose, not diagnose, but, but help give you some tricks for filing through NIME and learning what to do when you, you, you know just enough, but you don't really have a clue. Not really. <laughs> right. I know it's ugly, but uh, the process of going through everything that I showed you in this video will tell you all kinds of cool stuff. And, and as you're training and you right click on the learning monitors, um, you can clearly see this, this, uh, this business in action. So if I, if I went in and took off my row filter and just reset the whole thing, go there, and then I ran it to the very end or attempted to. Watch what happens. It's very neat. Those four guys on Adam and uh, uh, SGD, those four different learners that I have, are basically going through their training process. Let's, let's undo this. Get them out of the way. So this one is training my first one. I forgot which one it was. Oh yeah, and I told it to stop early if it's not if it's not working. Remember, I feed in validation data. Look at that. That didn't improve. That's why it stopped on Epoch Eleven. To conserve memory, I have all these weight nodes in there, so I don't run them all together. I have this one, wait for the one before it. This one, wait for the one before it. And uh, the string manipulation is just my way of unconfusing the, uh, the, uh, the, the optimizer, right? So where is it? Where did I put it? I don't see, I don't see it. Oh, here it is. SGD. That's just that's just me putting in an easier to reach string than all that that org dot whatever. And yeah, so it it does uh, RMS prop and SGD and Atom and and Adagrad. Um, those are the ones that I chose, and I can look at the validation data changing as it goes. Um. And what is it doing? It's testing models of models times four different optimizers. And if my stuff stops improving, it aborts. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. Hope this was helpful.